Hey guys, Stephanie here. Never gone live on YouTube. I don't even know if my people, if you guys are on YouTube this time of night. But if you are, hope you'll join me. I'm going to talk seed starting as I start seeds. Oh, I had my phone rigged up. And show you guys something really fun that I just found that I think is gonna be awesome for dealing with aphids. I've already tried it and it actually is awesome and answer any questions. So I'll wait a minute, see if we can get any people to join us live. Hi! So I need to start seeds and what I have going on here, I'm in my garage, everything's in the garage now. And I learned a lot this season. The transition's just a little bit tricky, but I have a bucket of water because it's freezing outside. So I didn't want to deal with that outside. And my rock wool is soaking. So we soak our rock wool for 20 minutes. You're gonna hear the towers cut on quite a bit. And then we plant our seeds. So we're gonna just plant some seeds and get started together here. And I will share um, what I'm starting and just my thoughts, why I'm using these particular seeds, and then ask me questions and hopefully I can answer them. Matter of fact, let me see if I can figure that out before we dive in. Is there a way to see? Um, let's do live chat. Okay, I think that means I can see. Remember to guard your, hmm. we'll see. If someone wants to post a comment, that would be awesome. Cause then I can see, or thumbs up or something. My phone is not on a tripod, it's on a very, it's actually on garden inserts that go inside these little green trays that we're gonna do. So these, first off, these are amazing. Um, when I'm done, I will put a link to everything in the description of this video if you're interested in some of the things I mentioned. I couldn't figure out how to do it before the live started. So I use these trays, they're super inexpensive. They've lasted me a really long time, so for the quality, they're pretty durable. And they have a dome top that goes on them, which is important when we're seed starting because we need to create that greenhouse effect if we're not going to be in a greenhouse. And I just wanna make sure. Okay, that if you guys say something, I can see it. I don't know if I can, but I think I can. I think I'm doing this right. So these are great. So what I'm gonna start with, I think we're gonna start with our peppers. So peppers can be tricky. It's, the key with peppers is make sure your seeds aren't too old. If your seeds are older than a year, I'd like to start them in a wet paper towel inside of a plastic bag. I have found that to be the best way to tell if they germinate and make sure I'm getting a good germination without wasting rock wool because peppers can take a while. I just put two into my towers and it's been like six weeks to get them to the right size. So they can take a couple of weeks to germinate, especially if you're trying to germinate them out of season, like I am, this garage is a little bit colder, even though I'm using a heat mat and all the same things. So just know that, uh, but this, these are brand new seeds. And these are from Pepper Joe's. I just found him on Instagram and I thought it was so fun to have somebody who just specializes in peppers. So I bought all my peppers from him and I'm gonna do an entire tower of just peppers. So 28 peppers total. So let's get those started first. So here's my container and I have a bucket of water on the floor here with my rock wool soaking in it. And I'm gonna let these drip for a minute. They've been soaking for the 20 minutes. And then I'm gonna drain any excess water because we don't want too much excess water. Mm, a little bit more. These hold so much water. And that's what makes them really great for hydroponics. Um, it's also why it's important to make sure your seedlings are the right size before you put them into your hydroponic system because they can get too waterlogged and this rock wool can start to just fall apart inside the towers. All right, so we're good there. These hold 12. And let's see what peppers I ordered. I ordered a combination of sweet and regular, and I'm not gonna know off the top of my head. This is Charleston, no idea what that is. I also focused on looking at the characteristics 
of the plants before I chose them, which I think is important. I don't think, I know that's very important when you're growing indoors because we're dealing with artificial lighting and limited space. So I didn't want peppers that were gonna be three feet tall when they're done. So I looked for varieties specifically on his site that said they were smaller plants. All right, one seed, one Charleston, that's all we need. You can do two seeds and thin them if you want. Um, I do wanna know if these germinated, so I am gonna do two seeds. I know I'll have germination, and then maybe I'll just share them with somebody else who has a tower locally, because I, I'm not labeling these. I have a free labeling document. It's in my tower garden journal. It comes in there, and then I have a free download in my stand store, and I'll put a link to all this stuff when I get done with this live. And you can write out what's going in each one of these rock bowls so you can keep track of it. But I'm not gonna do that today because I didn't plan ahead for that. So what I do in this case is I'm going to line my seeds up as I plant them, and then I'm gonna just keep this tray in order so I know which ones were which. Does that make sense? Like I know this is the first one on this row and I'll tag this first one. And I'm gonna do two seeds just in case. I think these came 20 to a package. So the good thing with tower gardening is we're not using a ton of seeds. I used to start entire seed packages, multiple seed packages for my soil gardens because there was so much loss and I don't have that kind of loss. So worst case, I uh, only one starts, but most likely both will, will um, germinate because these are new seeds and I will pluck the ones out and put them in a separate rock wool. And I've got a few friends that grow locally so I can share those. All right, so this variety is a jalapeno. This is a sweet jalapeno. I'm a huge fan of jalapenos on the towers. This one is a mang mangangi, I don't know, however you say that. Mangaji pepper. This was, actually I think this is a sweet pepper even though it looks hot. I'm pretty sure, a lot of these are Sweet, but not like a bell pepper sweet. They have a little heat to them, but their heat index was lower. So you can eat them more like a meal, which is nice. Like jalapenos, I stuff jalapenos and turn those into a meal. So good. All right, let's do two of these. If you guys have any gardening questions while we're live, make sure to post them in the comments so we can chat all things gardening. I don't know what these are. Free. That looks like they gave me some free seeds. Potapino. That's a jalapeno that grows small. I'm guessing by the name. You might want to go to Pepper Joe's and look that up if you're curious. So right now I'm starting my pepper seeds. We're going to do an entire tower of peppers this winter. Grown indoors. And the towers are all in, everything's doing great. The things that I started indoors are doing way better than the things I tried to transition indoors. This is a sweet heat. And it's just got me thinking that next year I'm gonna move the towers in. I'm actually contemplating growing in this garage year round to have indoor gardening year round, plus some outdoor. But I will definitely move things in earlier to have a better transition because right now I don't have any tomatoes to eat or peppers or things like that. So to eliminate that, I went to the grocery store today. It was insane. It was four radish. They were smaller than a golf ball, organic, were $5, four radish. There was a pack of four apples. I don't even remember, like a honey crisp. They called them artesian or artisan because you know that makes it sound like it's worth more. They're just honey crisp apples that were organic. They were six dollars. That means you're paying what is that two for a dollar seventy something per um, apple, which is insane. Did I do the math right on that? Anyway, six dollars for four apples is it, it just actually makes me so sad because most people 
including myself, can't afford to buy produce like that. So what's happening is they're driving people to the middle aisles where all the junk is. I'm reading a book right now. It's How Not to Diet. And he wrote a book called How Not to Die. And actually, he just came out with a new book entitled uh, How Not to Age. His books are amazing because, first off, they're this thick. And I love thick books with lots of content. But in the How Not to Diet, the whole beginning is talking about when the food industry changed and when human health started to change and what was going on with the food at the same time the autoimmune disorders started to go on the rise. This is a Ristra cayenne pepper um, and when obesity started to rise and it's absolutely correlated to commercial grocery, grocery store. Um, subsidies, all of that stuff. And it's a pay to play game at the grocery store. And the cheap food is what is the most profitable. So I was just reading this morning how like they'll take a can of crushed tomatoes and take a loss on the can of crushed tomatoes. The company will with the goal of getting people in the aisles to buy the high profit foods like potato chips or the other things they put around there. This is a red hot chili and it works, but it must not have been working good enough because now they're driving the produce up so much that it's absolutely insane. So then the non-organic radish were, five, uh, they were a bundle, so there was more of them. It was probably the same amount weight-wise of the organic but you got more radish because they were just smaller and those were $4. And I was just remembering like radish used to be 99 cents. So, and radish you can grow, you can grow in a tower. Um, you can grow a ton of them just in like a tub or like a plastic tub or a raised bin. So it was a good reminder to like get serious about growing food. This is uh, something yellow. No idea how to pronounce it because it's getting out of control out there for sure. And we can grow a lot of this stuff. So behind me, there's tomatoes. I have beets growing. The things I'm lacking are cilantro and dill peppers. Um, and then I'll show you guys some of the things I'm gonna start. We can grow a ton of food on these towers. You can't grow deep root vegetables like potatoes, carrots, um, I do have onions growing. Now to grow enough onions to replace the grocery store, that's gonna take some planning. And so it's something I'm working on and it takes more than one tower. If you have one tower, you're going to be limited to some herbs. You can grow some micro varieties of tomatoes, maybe a couple pepper plants and then greens and really replace the grocery store greens and things that you might be buying, which is still a lot of money. The tubs I saw for organic baby greens were um, like $6, so it's still very expensive. But you wouldn't want more than like a fourth of your tower, if you only have one tower, to be um, slow growing produce. Tomatoes take a while to get going. Peppers take a long time. Eggplant, squash, cucumbers, and eh, cucumbers not so much. Those are a little faster. But those, those foods take a while and they're slow. And so if you plant too many of them, then you get in a situation where you don't have anything to eat off your tower for a really long time. Onions the same. An onion takes a while to grow. I'm growing them in what we call the baby greens extension kit, if you're familiar with towers. So I can get a lot of them to grow um, but it's just weighing out the cost. I like to look at what's going to save us the most money at the grocery store and make sure I grow those things first. And then I have extra towers so I can give real estate to things that might not be, um, I don't know, as fast growing like onions. So it's a real estate thing. If you've got the space, do it. And I'm growing stinging nettle right now. I will be posting a video probably tomorrow on that. And I did a reel yesterday, if you wanna see what that looks like. I've been growing nettle for a while and that is something we do buy or we were buying at the store. And so I can, moving forward, I know I can grow all of our stinging nettle for tea for the year during the growing season by devoting for our family, I probably need to devote at least 
10 grow ports in the growing season to grow nettle. I can dry all of that because it grows really big when it's in season. And then I'll keep maybe four or five nettle plants growing indoors for fresh eating because I do like to make pestos out of it. Um, I juiced it. That's what I did with it last night. Made my juice with it. It grows super fast indoors too, like really fast. So it makes a good food source and that saves us money. So it's worth the real estate. If you drink chamomile tea, you could do an entire flex tower with your chamomile in season and store all your flowers for the year to replace the grocery store and then use your tower for something else once they're done producing. These, okay, love you Pepper Joe, but your seeds are a real pain to open. Never had a seed packet so complicated. I have a bum hand, but they're, they're not, not user friendly. I can't see if anybody's talking. I think I can. Either no one's talking or I cannot see the comments. I'll check in a second. All right, this one is a Marconi Giant. Oh, this thing is giant. It's like this big. And the other one I just planted was something red, just a red pepper. But this one, this big. I often say don't do giant food inside because it takes a long time for large produce. I always say choose the smallest variety. If you wanna grow peppers indoors, go for the snacking peppers. One of these was snacking peppers. But I have a lot of real estate on my towers and I would like to do fun experiments. So we're gonna go with these large pepper seeds. Oh, I need another. And that's kind of the thing to think about is choose things with short seasons. So if your romaine options are 75 days to maturity or 45, go with the 45. Oh, I can see somebody. I set up my new tower garden, started a bunch of seeds. How do you get all your seed starts to be ready at the same time? If you start slower seeds first, then lettuce last. Yes, so great question. Um, when you're first starting your tower, it takes, I would say six months to get in a really good interval planting process. And so one of my suggestions is to never fall out of that. Like make sure once you get your tower going, we never wanna get to where we're letting everything in it get over mature at the same time and then we have to clean it out and start over because it takes a while to get a good interval process. So what I do is start my pepper seeds and tomatoes um, and my things that take a lot longer and then I start some baby greens that are gonna be ready in three weeks. Now that's three weeks once they're in the tower and we need about a week before they go into the tower and I'll show you what those look like in a minute. We'll go ahead and start those seeds together. So I like to do some really fast growing things um, and set up at least a fourth of your tower with really, really fast growing things. And that will help. The other trick is I eat things younger when I'm first getting started. So right now, a lot of my produce is pretty young because it all got started about the same time. And so I have been harvesting bok choy's that are only half mature and eating those. But I have new seedlings that I've started that are pretty mature in my baby greens extension, or my uh, nursery. And so I can harvest that half grown bok choy, make meals out of it, and then have starch ready to take the place. That will kind of get you eating food a little bit faster too, until you get on that good interval planting guide. This one is a free Christian. So we will start our seeds. I'll show you in just a second. If I can get, these are the wonkiest pepper seeds. Okay, this is my last pepper, which I'm very glad about because those are hard to open. So another trick to make sure if you're starting a bunch of seeds like I am at the same time because your tower's just getting started, we need to put like things with like things. So I only have two peppers here. So I need to make sure I find something that is like a pepper that's gonna germinate about the same rate to go into here, or I'm gonna end up with things that sprout really quick and I need to take the dome off. And we don't wanna take the dome off until we have about 90% germination or 80%. So before I start those lettuce seeds, I wanted to show you, I'm gonna go ahead and do, There, I have some um, baby cauliflower. So cauliflower is gonna come up a little bit slower and it's also pretty hardy if you had to leave the dome on longer. If my peppers take a little bit of time.
to sprout. So this is baby cauliflower and it is ready in 28 days. Regular cauliflower is mature in 60 days. Now regular cauliflower is going to be, you know, the size of a grocery store cauliflower. And these are going to be super small. They're only two to three inches but it is a trick to get cauliflower when you wanna grow indoors because the regular heads of cauliflower, they take too long. The success rate to get that giant vegetable head isn't super great. So I'm testing these little baby ones to see if they're more like a kohlrabi where they'll just kind of be ready quickly. They're smaller. They don't have so much pressure where they need the sun and the elements. The larger the produce, the harder it is to grow indoors. Now, if you're growing outdoors in season, go for it. It'll do great. All right, so this one is peppers and cauliflower, and I need to tag these before we move on or I'm going to forget the order. Hold up. And I have a seed starting PDF you can download for free in my stand store. Um, but I didn't print one out. So all I'm doing is tagging where my first seed was and I know which order I went in and I just kept my stack of pepper seeds together. So I know where it starts, starts here, ends here. And I will make a label, I'll make a, like a note of that in my tower gardening journal. I have a journal for this exact reason. So I'm just gonna store these in my little envelope here so I don't lose track. Okay, so let's start some baby greens. So these are the things that'll start super quickly and get you eating food on your tower really quickly while you're waiting for some other things. When you're starting seeds, so the, the reason I created the journal is because there's a learning curve to knowing when to start the next set of seeds. So one of my customers and friends texted me earlier today, her snacking pepper plant that she's growing indoors just started blooming and was asking if she should start her new seeds. I was draining this. And I said, yes, now's the time. It's still a little plant. It's gonna get much bigger and it's just now starting to fruit, but peppers take a while to even get to that stage. So that's your secret to knowing like with peppers, when to start another one. And you might end up where they, you started a little bit too early and next time you need to wait three weeks or so. So that's what the journaling is for. So you can make note of that because I can give you guys my suggestions and ballpark with lettuce. I say start your baby greens every two weeks, but your environment may be a little bit different than mine, how quickly you eat them and how much you eat may be a little bit different. I say start seeds every two weeks and the majority of those seeds, 80%, are fast growing things. And start one fourth the amount of grow ports you have on your tower. So if you've got 28 grow ports, you wanna start, what is the math on that? Seven seedlings every two weeks. Out of those seven, five are gonna be something like these baby greens. And then two can be thinking ahead of, okay, my tomato plant started fruiting a month ago and I wanna make sure I don't run out of tomatoes, so I better start a new tomato seed, that kind of stuff. So we're gonna do some baby greens mix. So we have our rock wool and the holes. I highly recommend the Tower Garden rock wool. I've seen people buy it on Amazon or other places. My mother-in-law bought from another place and it didn't have the right hole in it. And she was trying to make holes and then her rock wool fell apart. It just was a mess. It was too big to go into the tower. So their quality, I'm just happy with it. When you're starting these baby greens, I like to purchase the seeds from True Leaf or another company that does sprouting seeds. So if we take a package like this, these can cost, you know, anywhere from now, they're probably like $3. They used to be about $1.95 at the lowest, all the way up to five, depending on the company. And there with lettuce baby greens, there's only about 100 seeds in there and you're gonna go through that super fast. So if we do sprouting seeds, we can save a ton of money because this is four ounces. I think I paid $16 for it. It's this full. I can start seeds, baby greens for a year with this for $16. It's amazing. That's so many greens. This, it's really incredible how much food you can get off of these. So what we do is take a hefty pinch and I am going to line the entire bottom of my rock wool. I don't wanna to go too many layers thick. 
Um, but I want a nice clean layer along the bottom. I've counted the seeds before. It was close to 50 seeds. Not that I think you should count them. If you spill them along the top, that's totally fine too. Can I leave some net cups empty if I don't? Yeah, if you don't, if your food is ready to go into the tower, first off, wait until it has roots on all four sides. The question was, can we leave net cups empty if we don't have enough starts? Yes, so wait till you have roots on all four sides of your starts and don't put them in too early. That is where the biggest failure rate comes from is putting them in too early and they get waterlogged or they just get stunted. A lot of times it just causes them to sit there and do nothing for two weeks. And then I'll get questions like, why aren't my plants growing? It's just they're in shock because it's too much water. They weren't ready for the tower. So let them get roots on all five sides, the bottom and all four sides. And then if you have extra grow ports that are, or net pots, grow ports, what are they called? Grow ports that aren't filled, you can do a couple of things. They sell these little covers. I have one right here. On Amazon. Now, I don't recommend these because ultimately we never want to be in that situation where you have open grow ports. If you're following my interval planting process, we can eliminate that by starting seeds frequently and staying on top of it. So you can also just put like a piece of tin foil. I've seen people cut up pool noodles and make little circles out of that. So just something to cover it. The reason we want to cover them, if they're outside to keep rain out and if they're indoors, we don't want light getting into our tower because the green algae that you can see on your net, on your rock wool um, when you're starting your seedlings comes from nutrients, water and light coming together. So we wanna keep light out of the inside of the tank for the health of the roots of the plants and just to prevent anything from growing in there. So just grab a pool noodle or what I say? Aluminum, something. It didn't have to be something that's gonna block the light and you'll be fine. Okay, so we have our seedlings here. I don't know if you guys can see that, but there is a nice layer of those seeds on the bottom, about one layer thick. There's some along the top here, that's totally fine. And then we're gonna cover these with vermiculite. And there's a stink bug that just fell out of that. And we're just lightly covering. Most seeds like light to germinate. And so we wanna allow some light to come through there. We're not going for a super thick filling it. We're not gonna fill the hole to the top of the vermiculite, just a light dusting. That keeps them protected. Um, and then if seeds like darkness, it allows them a little bit of darkness, just like the soil. We plant seeds in the soil. We don't wanna plant them too deep or they won't have enough light to germinate, but we also don't want them just sitting on the top where they can be exposed to air and too much light. So this one's ready to go. And let's start some herbs. I need some herbs really badly. And then I'm gonna show you guys after I start this one, a little trick I found for aphids that I've been super um, excited about because it's working. Aphids, oh, my rock wool's falling apart. So you don't wanna leave your rock wool in the water soaking too long, which is what I did. So I'm gonna pull these out actually because it's starting to fall apart. I'm just gonna go ahead and load my trays. If you guys have questions, let me know. And I'll keep thinking of things to talk about. My water in here, if you're growing indoors, you should not have issues with your tank becoming super cold. We want our water to be the ideal temperature for growing. And when I say ideal, you know, that's, I don't know. We can, I don't want to say like it's 70 degrees and then if you're at 65, that's a problem. 65 is fine. I say somewhere in the 65 to 75 range is ideal. And this garage, the temperature is great, but my water is really, really cold. It's freezing my hands just because I'm in a garage. And so what you can do about that if you want to grow in a garage or a basement is put tank heaters, fish tank heaters into your tower. Um, the reason I like to talk about growing in the garage or basements is because if you want to grow the majority of your own food, you will need more than one tower. And so we've got to kind of get creative because I cannot fit towers in my house. We have a really small cabin. 
And if you're gonna do a fish tank heater, I bought some from a company that sells tower garden supplies and they're not strong enough. They don't heat, they only heat the water right near the heat, the tank heater. So I found the best option is to purchase a little above the gallon, the wattage for the gallons you have. So I ordered some that are, mine are 200 watt. They have a temperature gauge on them so it'll read the level of the water. So I know if I need to turn it down or up. And that 200 watt serves a fish tank up to, I think it was 30, 20 to 40 gallons. And so our tanks are 20 gallons. So I, would, I jumped it up a notch so that it had enough power. I found the ones, if you buy it like a 10 gallon to 15 gallon one for a home unit, it's probably not gonna be strong enough. All right, I almost have all of these pulled out. And this is what I do. I to garden and grow our own food. I sit in the garage, usually don't go live, I'll listen to a podcast or something. But these are the tasks, and this is one of my favorite tasks because it's just exciting. It's like the hope of new food and all the potential that comes with it. It's like going to a farmer's market where you get to buy all that fresh food. It's kind of that same romantic feeling. All right, one more. I think I'm good here. I do 12, but you don't have to do 12. If you only have one tower, or you're just getting started, or you're only gonna be starting seven seeds every two weeks, because you have one tower with 28 grow ports, then just do the seven rock wool. And you may, if you're two of those are gonna be peppers, you may need to put two rock wool in one of these trays and um, the rest in another, because we wanna line them up with like things so that we don't have any germination issues where one's germinated and something else hasn't. All right, I have some extra waffles here. Okay, so let's start a few other things here. We're ready to go. Um, I am starting enough for two more towers, th maybe even three more towers that aren't in the garage yet. So we're gonna do some dill and then I'll talk about how many seeds to plant per rock wool with each of these things. And so dill is going to germinate at about the same rate as cilantro. So we'll put those together. And, oh, this one's really cool. I've got some really fun things to show you guys. Um, and I'm gonna do this king of the bitters. So with these, be careful if you're doing what I'm doing and your table's wet, because we don't want to get our seed packets wet. Okay, so we're going to do dill. Dill, if you overseed dill, it will not thrive. It actually bolts, when and bolts is when it goes to seed pretty quickly. So I have found the best way to do dill is one plant per rock wool and then let it get big and bushy. Today, I'm going to do two and thin them. I don't often do that because I don't like to waste seeds, but I have not had dill in like two months because I just forgot to start it multiple times. I forgot to buy seeds and I really need dill. Dill is a big part of our diet. So let's start two seeds per rock wool, but you only want one to grow into a plant. Two would probably do fine too. I haven't tried two. I may let two grow just to see. But once you get in the, definitely in the like four and up, they just aren't happy. And you don't get that giant dill plant. And small dill, if you use a lot of dill, is not really useful. It's that full-size dill plant that really allows you to come harvest handfuls of it for recipes. Okay, so I started four rock wool of those. I'm gonna start five. I miss my dill. Okay. And then your seeds, if you wanna keep your seeds fresh longer, you wanna get a Mylar bag. And a Mylar bag is like a metal bag. Eh, that's not a metal one. 
I don't have one to show you guys. Kind of like this, but bigger. And they, you can buy them with Ziploc tops. It just keeps the moisture out and then keep them in a cool place. You can keep them in the fridge. Because we're not using so many seeds like we would in a soil garden, we want to keep our seeds fresh because they're going to last us a long time. This is cilantro slow bolt. This is the only variety I purchase. You can buy the slow bolt variety from multiple places. These are from rareseeds.com. And with cilantro, I'm going when I'm indoors. This one is preference. I like a cilantro plant to be its own plant. I feel like it gets bushy and is great, but you can go as high as six seeds. I'm going to do two seeds per rock wool. One plant can be a little bit leggy for a tower, and six to me stunts the growth of some of them. Oh, I just put those in with my dill. Oops, I'm going to have to fish those out. So I'm going to do two seeds per rock wool. I'm going to try three in this one, but I'm going to stick to the one to three for all of these. And I saw your comment. I'll check it in just a second. Cilantro goes to seed pretty quickly outdoors or any um, exposure to heat. Indoors, not as fast, but it's still a fast turnover crop. These are food herbs. These are herbs that are not designed to sit in your tower for months on end. They are gonna grow. You can eat off of them. Never take more than a third at a time because it'll stress your plants. And then when they are mature, we wanna have already started new seeds and have a new plant ready to take its place. And then we harvest the whole thing. Definitely when it starts to show signs of bolting, um, what it'll do is the cilantro will send out a thicker stem and it'll start to look like carrot leaves instead of uh, the cilantro leaves. And that is definitely a sign, I'll be right back. Oh no, here, that it is going to flower. Um, cilantro seeds, again, it's hard to say how often because every environment's different, but I would say you wanna be starting seeds once a month with cilantro if you wanna make sure you don't have gaps. So you may end up harvesting a younger cilantro, like mid-size growth to make room for the new one, but that's more food, faster turnover. How do you refill on the tank? I set up the first tank, do you add water? So every time you add water, the question is how do you refill the tank? So every time you add water, you need to add nutrients. I do not fuss with my tank. Some people add water like weekly. I let my tanks go to halfway. Sometimes I let them go way lower than that, typically. I wouldn't fill it up anytime before halfway. Halfway is like the earliest or the ideal. And I just add the water back to the tank and then add half the nutrients. Um, and you can just eyeball it. It's not gonna like destroy your tank if you, as long as you don't do full strength and you're only adding half the water, like it's not a super precise thing where you have to measure exactly the right millimeters based on the gallons you add, or I don't, never have, so, and I've never had any problems with it. I just wait till it gets halfway and then add half nutrients is the ideal. Okay, so these, We did our cilantro and our dill. And I didn't do the king of the bitters because I ran out of space. I wanted a lot of cilantro. So this is king of the bitters. This is a medicinal herb and really great superfood. It gets really, really large. So this is something you could grow in like a permaculture garden and use it as medicine. But when it's a baby, we can use it as baby greens and it's super medicinal. And I'm going to grow these as a small green because it does get 10 feet tall. And to do that, when you're trying to get a big plant to be smaller to produce something, a couple of different options. I'm growing some moringa, which is actually a tree. So I'm growing one seed of moringa and letting it get bushy and cutting it. With these, it didn't come with a whole lot of seeds. So I'm gonna do three seeds per rock wool on this one because they're super tiny seeds and it's not an overabundance. 
And I'll make a YouTube on this particular herb because this is definitely a more advanced thing to grow um, on how to manage something like this to keep it going as long as possible. The trick with something like this is cutting it in a way that doesn't stress it to the point of going to seed, but also staying on top of harvesting it to keep it under control because it is such a large plant. We don't want, we want it to dwarf and we need to kind of force it to dwarf. And again, I'll make a whole video on that because that's a little more than I can go into on a live. But no, you can grow some really cool medicinal plants on your tower. And these are superfoods that you cannot buy at a grocery store. You can't even buy most of them at a farmer's market. So I'm gonna cover these with vermiculite so I don't forget which ones I loaded like I just did with the cilantro. Do you have recommendations on which pH tester to use when you need to test the water? So I use what comes with Tower Garden. And they just, use, they just do the little thing here with the liquid dropper. I have ordered all my towers and then I've ordered the pH plus once because I use it to make a powdery mildew spray. So I go through the pH plus a little bit faster and it comes with that. And I've never needed more than that. I don't check my pH very often. I know I'm on some Facebook group forums because I like to see what questions people ask. And I hear like when anything is wrong with a plant, I'll see people saying the pH or check your pH. Rarely is the pH a problem. We have a wide range and the pH with aeroponics is different than hydroponics. So aeroponic plants are, and I'm not saying it's not important, but it's not as important as I hear people discuss with it. And rarely are the problems I see online a pH problem. I've only had a pH problem once in the last year. So I totally lost my train of thought there. Um, so I just use this version to test this. And if anybody remembers what I was just saying, I totally lost my train of thought on that. Um, the pH, one time I had the problem was my plants turned yellow. So I could see that they were yellowing. And a friend just actually messaged me and her plants are super limey. And she was asking, could it be this, could it be that? And in that situation, like we don't know exactly what's wrong, but it's not that your pH, unless your pH is really off, hers wasn't even off. And then the situation when it happened to mine, my pH was fine as well. It was either when I put the nutrients in, I accidentally doubled up on one side or another, not really sure, or water got into the tank and diluted the tank down. Don't really know what caused the yellowing. But in that case, if you were to get lots of yellowing, I say dump your tank and start over and put the right amount in. With the pH in this garage, like I haven't checked any of these plants. Not I, I put them in here, I loaded them with water, and I have just found it doesn't, the, the issues with most plants are that they're too old. So plants hit, hit a peak and then they start to go on a decline. So that's just my, I don't know if that's great advice, but I don't spend a lot talking on the pH part. And I, someone told me that Tim Black, the inventor of these, and he didn't say this to me and I didn't get it straight from his teachings, but I just was glad to hear it because it was kind of my thoughts. What I've seen is you put the tank water in and the nutrients, and then people start to fuss with the pH, trying to get that optimal level. Well, to do that, we have to add the, the minus and the plus and the minus and the plus and go back and forth. And you actually end up over nutri adding too many nutrients and things to the tank. And he had said, the person who told me who mentioned this, said that then the roots, oh, I remember what I was talking about. Okay, then the roots will create this like protective barrier because there's too many nutrients and then it messes things up. So I lean on the side of people that fuss with their towers too much have the most problems. So I've seen people who will take their tower indoors and outdoors because they don't want to buy a light kit and they're moving it back and forth or they're trying to get it to a light on a window and rotating it or keeping it in their garage and it's going in and out and in and out. 
that is not what we wanna do. We wanna set these things up, leave them alone, and don't fuss with them unless they need us to fuss with them. And that is where I find the greatest success. But aeroponics is a little bit different than hydroponics. And this is the thought that left my brain. Aeroponic roots are in the air 80% of the time. And so they're really effective at absorbing the nutrients they need and leaving the rest. If that's what makes them different than hydroponics and why we don't have to fuss with checking and adding different things and staying on top of the minerals because they are just gonna take in what they need and leave the rest. So there's some thoughts I've heard, like if you have tomatoes and you let your tank go all the way down, then it may be depleted of calcium or things like that. I have let my tanks, most of the time they go almost empty and then I refill them. Cause I found if they did for a moment have a deficiency, it's kind of made up as soon as they get access to that water and nutrients again. I've had a butter crunch lettuce be a little too light green, but they, all the other veg is fine. Maybe it's placement of the plant. Might have been the type of butter crunch. There's, I've got one here. Um, some of them are super limey green. So it could be the variety that you were growing. I've also had situations where I purchased one variety and something else grew. That's, I've seen that before. I don't think I have one here, but a butter crunch can be super limey. I have, if you go back and look at some of my reels, I grew some over the summer that were gigantic and gorgeous and they were very, very lime green. So that might've been all it was. Yeah, because I can't think of why. Now, some plants, I was just trying to process. My friend that sent me the picture recently, some of her plants went yellow before others. But you would know, yellowing because of some sort of deficiency is a vining yellow. So you can almost see dark green vines and then yellowing happening. If the whole plant is yellow, yeah, with lighter green or lighter pale, like this right here. This starts off dark green, and if you didn't know, you would think that I would think there's something wrong with this plant because that's not a healthy color typically, but this plant is actually supposed to be that way. It's called golden beauty because it turns out golden once it's immature. But that's very different than a, an issue. You'll see vining if there's an issue with nutrients. Yeah, if you don't like that variety, definitely try another one. That's always an option too. I'm gonna start some lettuce right now. Let's do, what did I just plant? I'm talking and can't think and talk at the same time. Oh, king of the bitters. So I need to be careful what I plant with that. Uh, but this lettuce, look at this. This is a Pablo. It's crispy and it's gorgeous, that color. It's kind of in the iceberg family. So I also often get the question too, why is my lettuce... Uh, limp or not crunchy and it's important that you choose the kind of lettuce you like to eat as well because not all lettuce is the same lettuce is going to have different flavors different textures this one's a chadwick um, rodon that's going to be a denser i can tell by just looking at it this is going to be a little bit heartier green and have a richer flavor to it I'm trying to see what other lettuce so if you like crispy lettuce, make sure you're purchasing varieties that are crispy. Endive is a great option. It's definitely a stronger flavor. I like to grow endive on the towers. Just makes salads a little bit more interesting. This one right here, the Uticool. This was free seeds. This is in the romaine family. This is what romaine used to look like versus the grocery store. So when you're dealing with heirlooms, you're gonna get different looking foods too. And romaine, when it's a baby, is a little bit softer. So if we want that crunchy romaine head, one of the suggestions I recommend is grow baby romaines. They grow quickly and you'll get that nice crunch that you're going for from a mature head. Something like this, you're just gonna get more leaf lettuce. My garden on the back. My garden on the back deck of my screened in room. It gets sun and plenty of air. And this year I had Pest, couldn't figure it out. Oh yeah, what kind of pest did you have? Um, pests can come through screens, depending on the pest. Okay, I need to plant something with this king of the bitters. These are more delicate to start. 
So I'm gonna focus on some things that are a little bit more delicate so I can keep an eye on this particular tray. Things like baby greens, I'm not worried about it. I put them in the nursery, the grow, the seedling grow station. This is a pink celery. This is Chinese celery. Very, very strong flavor. Celery is another one if you're new to gardening. Celery can be very flavorful when it's homegrown. And different types of celery have different flavors. And that can be shocking to people because grocery store celery is so lacking in flavor. The trick with celery, it's very finicky to start and it's slow to get going. So I plant about six to 10 seeds per rock wool. And then once they turn into about five inches tall, when they're about two inches and have roots on all four sides, I'm gonna put them in the tower and I'll put them somewhere like the Baby Greens extension kit and just let them grow. And then when they get about five inches, six inches tall, I will break open that rock wool and I'll carefully pull them apart and I'll give each celery its own grow port so that I can get that traditional grocery store kind of celery. Celery can be slow to start. So it's one that I recommend if you want celery and you wanna harvest celery consistently, you need to be starting seeds every six weeks. And you can eat off of your celery as it's maturing, but then we wanna be able to harvest that whole grocery store head and start over. So this is great. This is color, lots of nutrients when we can eat the rainbow. And it's just, I, what I do with this is I dehydrate it and turn it into a powder and it's almost like a celery salt and you don't have to add salt to it. And then I use it for soups and things. And I had a jar of it and it's almost gone. So we're gonna start those. I'm gonna cover this with rock wool because I'm very distracted and I'm gonna forget. So I did three of those with multiple seeds. Now again, if you only have one tower, oh, you might only wanna do like one rock wool with six seeds and then you can break however many do turn into plants apart. Let's do another fun one that might be new to you guys. Amaranth, this is a Chinese spinach, so fun really big on eating different colored foods. Um, on my cucumbers, that was mold, and on my other plants, aphids. Yeah, okay, aphids will go through a screen. Aphids actually are probably in your house anyway. Um, and the mold is powdery mildew, and I have a recipe for that. So with cucumbers, first off, with this amaranth, I have not grown this indoors. Um, I'm gonna do, I'm trying to look at what how it grows, because that'll tell me, like if we want a cabbage and we want it to look like a cabbage, we plant one seed. I'm gonna plant, I'm gonna do a couple with one seed, because this looks pretty full. I'm gonna do a couple with more, and we'll just experiment. So, cucumbers. If you're growing on a porch, I recommend only growing dwarf varieties. And the difference in cucumbers is, you're going to have like a traditional cucumber is very vining and it's going to produce fruit consistently throughout the season. That's not what we want to grow in that situation. When I'm growing in here, I'm going to grow patio or container varieties and they are only going to produce 20 fruit or so. Sometimes it'll tell you in the catalog how many fruit. It's just going to produce its fruit. The leaves, as it starts to produce fruit, the leaves are gonna to start to get brown, a little bit funky. All the energy is going into creating the fruit and the plant's gonna to start to look not so great. And so I'll see a lot on forums, like what's wrong with my cucumber? And someone will say it's disease. Really, it's just the energy in those short lived plants going into making the fruit and it's fine. Um, and then it's done. And so we need to be starting new seeds because after you get that 20, the one I'm growing right now says it gets 20 fruit. I think it gets about 12 in my environment. And then I need to turn it over and plant another one. With the mold that gets on there, it's powdery mildew. And I use a formula of 16 ounce water bottle. And I add water to that. And then I put one, two, sorry, two capfuls of the pH plus into the 16 ounce water bottle. And then I add one cap full, which is like a teaspoon of dish soap that's clean, shake that up and that's what you spray. So anytime I see powdery mildew, which is very common if you're growing on a porch in cooler weather, 
or indoors. Then I spray the leaves as a preventative and it gets it under control really, really quickly with aphids. Aphids, and I'll talk about aphids next uh, because we're gonna roll into that. My phone's gonna die soon. Um, aphids come in on pests. They come in on produce. So if you eat a whole food diet, they're probably already in your house. They're just not on things that you would see them on. So it's not until they get on our lettuce that we notice we have them and then they multiply. So an aphid can multiply by six every single day. So they can go from nothing to out of control really quickly if we don't manage them. So I have them in this garage. I have them every year, it's just part of it. I have them outside too, so we have them year round. And when I'm growing outside in season, I don't have to worry about them because there's enough predators to manage them so I don't even know that they exist. And that's typically what's going on in our environments. They're there, we just don't see them. When we start to isolate our plants and grow out of season or we're growing really early in the spring, like in this garage, and then I put my food outside, I beat the pests because I'm growing out of season. So there's nothing to manage them and they can get out of control really quickly. So we have to be the bigger pest. So I made a video and I talk about how I manage my towers because I have them. I release ladybugs. And so if you're on a screen porch, you can totally release ladybugs into the screen porch. They don't mess up your house or anything, or I haven't found they mess up the garage. And I buy them on eBay. And that keeps my aphids down in this garage. Or another option is I just every day check my plants and if I see one, remove them and I just stay on top of it. It's when we ignore them because they can multiply by six every single day that they can get out of control. Now I found this new tool and it's been so fun. Hold on. And I'll put a link to my stand store. The light's getting messed up in here. To my, hold on. Oh, much better. It was blinding my, it was like coming back at my face. So I'll put a link to all this once I get off because it won't let me do it until then. I found this handy dandy tool. So I have used those sprayers where you can blow air on your, on your keyboard of your computer. I've used those before and I was recording with a sweet friend, Josie in Canada. We were doing some teachings in French and I was saying how I've used those before and she was mentioning like, well, then it blows the aphids around. An aphid is not gonna, if an aphid falls off your tower, it's not gonna climb all the way back up to the top. It's a very, very tiny, very small moving. It's gonna find the nearest food, yes. But the, it's not, the, the way they spread is not by crawling, they spread because they multiply so fast. So all we have to do is keep them off our plants. So I ended up looking for another blower and by accident, I ordered this thing and it's actually a vacuum. So we don't have to worry about them blowing off. And it has worked so great, it's actually been so fun. So it comes with these different contraptions. And I was using this, I have a tomato plant that has some aphids on it and I don't like to mess with them because I was causing the fruiting blooms every time I would mess with it to fall because I was just being so rough. So I vacuumed those off today with this nice soft bristle and it saved my blossoms and then I put this one on and I found some you know they hide in the small inner parts of your cabbages and things I've got tons of bok choy and napa cabbages and this goes right in there and it vacuumed them off with like no problem at all and I was able to see the microscopic little babies and they were all gone so I highly recommend a little vacuum so fun you can just go check on your plants and I'm going to use this one to kind of maintain because they can be on there and be so small you don't even know it, and just brush off my plants. Not something you have to do every day. I say if you have, if you know you have them, once you get them under control, then it's like a every three days I just go check on my plants. I think it's good to check on your plants anyway and spend time with your plants. It's very therapeutic, but this is great. A mini vacuum, very happy. It also has the option to put this on this side. And this is the blower. So I did try this as well and just kind of, especially with something that's delicate like that tomato, I just was going through and kind of blowing off. I couldn't even see any aphids, but I figured it couldn't help to clean it up a little bit. So a great way to clean your plants. Never, ever, ever 
spray your plants with anything for aphids. It does not work. It doesn't get rid of them and it'll mess up your plants. A friend did it, customer, and she said it made all her lettuce taste terrible and damaged her plants. And it just was a hydrogen peroxide or alcohol. I don't remember what she put on there. Uh, neem oil does not work. It, it doesn't work. If you have aphids, you have aphids. And neem oil can make your plants sticky and make a hot mess. Speaking of blossoms, is it normal to lose a lot of patio baby eggplant blossoms growing for the first time? And I have a few growing, but I have a lot of the blossoms though. I, I have, um, you are pollinating them. So a baby, an eggplant is self-pollinating. So you can't really pollinate them. You might wanna add some airflow and you could do that with this thing. So this is another tool for that. The way we pollinate or help it would, if they're falling off, it's pollination, which you're not always gonna get 100%, especially growing indoors, and especially with cucumbers. Cucumbers don't ever, even outdoors, don't ever produce 100% of the blossoms. They put off more than the plant can handle, just like survival of the plant. But you can use something like this. We, when we have self-pollinating, we need airflow. And so you can just stick this on there and it's, blowing good air and you can just go around your plants and get them. Some people say put a fan on them. I don't have a fan in here. I've never had a fan in here and I, don't, I haven't found I needed it, but this would be a handy tool. You could shake your plants. Yeah, a lot of the blossoms falling off. Now, are they falling off while they're still fresh or after they're dead? Because sometimes like one of my blossoms just fell off, but it's already left behind the part that's gonna make fruit. Um, a small family's on my list, and that's good. Yeah, crisping up your lettuce, any kind of, I, I don't use a fan, but I do touch my plants all the time. I'm always lifting them up and checking them. I think it's important to have your hands on your plants. I pull off any leaves that look damaged, and I fuss, I don't fuss with my tanks, but I do handle my plants quite a bit, which I think makes them healthier and stronger. And it might just be, what are your temperatures that you're growing in for eggplant? It might be um, that they just don't love the environment around 70. Yeah, then it, and if they're the first blossoms too, I would just give it time. A patio baby can produce 50 fruit and it's, cycle and it's growing cycle and so maybe it's just putting off peppers will do that a lot of times you'll see a lot of pepper blossoms drop early on they'll send out blooms that aren't going to turn into food and then they drop and then they'll start to produce food so it could be that I haven't grown them inside in a while so I forget a lot of my indoor stuff because it's been you know eight what was it, eight nine two, yeah I grow four months in the garage and eight months outside, so it's been a while, so I'm excited to be back in the garage. Okay, I'm gonna start one more set, and then I'm probably gonna lose battery. So let me know if you guys have questions. We're gonna do, I'm gonna do spinach later. Um, let's talk about a few of these fun things. Another thing too, your squash and your cucumber, when growing indoors, a lot of times the leaves will come in crunchy. The first few leaves are super curled up and if you touch them, they feel crunchy. They're not normal leaves. Ride it out. For some reason, those particular plants grown indoors at a season just need a minute to go through something to adjust and then they start to produce healthy, soft, normal leaves. Mine have been going through that for a couple of weeks now and we just moved out of that phase and they started pumping out gorgeous leaves. And I just remembered, because I haven't grown indoors in a while, I was like, oh, that's right, that's a thing. Don't worry about it, it doesn't, it's not a big deal. Where is what I wanted to grow? Okay, here's some fun things. Let's do these, just to show you guys. This. This one is the one I was looking for. Look at this, saltus. So it grows this lettuce 
And a lot of people like to leave their lettuce and harvest leaves over time and leave it there for a really long time. And I'm always screaming, don't do that. Harvest the whole thing, start over. You know, you can eat off of it a third, you know, never more than a third because we don't want to stress it. And what will happen is you'll get long, leggy lettuce as it does that. If you harvest lettuce off of your plant, instead of turning into a head, if you're doing it too much, it's going to turn into this long, leggy thing. Well, this one's designed to do that. So you can eat off of it. And then the result is you get this really thick stem here that's food. And it's supposed to taste really amazing. So I'm super excited to grow these. I would grow them somewhere they have room to go up and you might want to tie some twine around the lettuce and oh I just remember my chickens are out I'm definitely gonna have to get off in a minute and uh, tie it around the tower so that it doesn't fall over and break all right we're gonna start these and then I'm gonna pray my chickens are okay we're gonna start some bok choy so with this lettuce it's one seed per rock wool we don't want more than that this is not a multi-seed thing. This is a plant we want to become exactly what it looks like on the picture. If you want it to look like the picture on your package, then it's one seed per rock wool. Okay, and then we're gonna do some of these gorgeous bok choy. These are super thin, you can see. So I'm gonna do two seeds per rock wool because we can get that same look and have room for two because this is a little bit thinner. It's really hard to do this with this hand brace on. One, two. Bok choys are gonna grow fast. They're super food. Give you lots of abundance. Okay, I'm gonna put rock wool on these. And that's, I'm gonna show you guys the one I'm gonna do in a minute, but I'm gonna go make sure my chickens aren't gonna get murdered because they will get murdered. I never let them out. And I have this automatic door I need to put on, but I didn't, not yet. Okay, let me check. If you guys have any questions, let me know. I'm gonna show you guys this last one. This is a mustard and it's got the same thing. It's gonna produce this stock that's food and it gives you texture and different flavors and different textures I think are amazing. Thanks for joining me on this live guys and all the questions. I love getting the questions because it helps me just know, you know what to practice and to find answers for and you know, what people might be looking for as far as questions go out there. Hope you have a very Merry Christmas and I will see you guys next week.